Well, greetings and welcome to week seven of our study in the book of Colossians. Uh, tonight, we're going to move, be moving on to chapter two. Uh, chapter one, we considered the supremacy of Christ. And uh, as we move now into chapter two, our focus is going to be on the sufficiency of Christ. And so tonight, we're going to try to deal with two sections, um, the wish and the way, which are covered in uh, Colossians chapter two and in the first, uh, first eight verses. So let's just commit our time to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we do thank you for the privilege we have of, of week by week opening your word. We thank you for the freedom that we have in this country uh, to open your word, to read it, to study it, uh, to declare it, and that uh, we thank you that it has been kept and preserved for us over the years. We thank you that not only is the word uh, important, but it is also relevant it was written to people two centuries ago, or 2,000 years ago, rather, uh, and yet today <clears throat> the same word uh, is as relevant today as the day that it was written. And so we pray that you would open our hearts and our eyes and our ears uh, to hear those things from yourself that will be helpful as we uh, walk together with you uh, in this life. We do pray all of these things in our Savior's precious name. Amen. Very good. So again, we'll start with the first part of our, our lesson, and let's uh, go to our passage, Colossians chapter 1, sorry, rather, Colossians chapter 2, uh, Colossians chapter 2, and starting in verse 1, and let's read these verses together. Verse 1 of chapter 2, For I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, <clears throat> that their heart may be encouraged being knit together in love and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words, for though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As you therefore have received Christ, uh, Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of this world, and not according to Christ. And we're going to stop right there. <clears throat> That's our, our passage under consideration tonight. Even though in most Bibles it would go on for a couple more verses, but I want to tie those last two verses uh, to our study for next week. Uh, so we pray the Lord would bless the reading of his word as we consider these things. So let's just dive into our study again tonight, and we'll be, um, we'll be looking at uh, the wish, uh, what Paul desired for the people of um, people of Colossae. And so as we've been reminded, we're talking about the sufficiency of Christ, the first part of it being the wish in the first three verses. And here we would say the beginning, our title for this would be concerning the conflict for unknown believers. Uh, we've mentioned it repeatedly now that Paul most likely has never met these believers. Uh, he's never been with them face to face. And yet he still has a great desire for them, a great heart for them. And so he begins this session or this section of his letter by telling them of a great conflict or struggle that he has for the believers in the Lycus Valley. And that would include, of course, Colossae, Laodicea, and even Hierapolis, although it was not directly named in this passage. Um, <clears throat> before we consider the conflict that Paul has, let's just consider Paul himself as he uh, begins by bearing his soul uh, to the believers first. And he lays out these things. And there are four things that we know about Paul as we begin to read this passage. Number one, as Paul writes this, we know that he is in prison. He is in prison. Uh, we mentioned that in the introduction that Paul was under house arrest in Rome. So not really prison, but he was certainly captive uh, by the Roman authorities, but still able to receive visitors and to write letters and to receive letters uh, from others. This imprisonment lasted about two years. 
and uh, <clears throat> commonly thought to be around uh, the late 50s, uh, 59, 60, maybe even as late as 61 or 62, uh, during the time that he was in prison. We don't know the exact date. But during this time, he wrote a number of letters, mostly to churches, and one uh, personal letter to his friend Philemon, who again, as we mentioned in our introduction, was located there in the city of Colossae. Um, the other letters that he wrote were the, the book of Ephesians, uh, the letter to the Ephesians, the letter to the Philippians, and this letter to the Colossians, as well as the letter to, um, uh, to Philemon. <clears throat> And he asked them, as he wrote the letter, to take that letter and to share it with the others, those in uh, Hierapolis and Laodicea, the larger cities that were very close by. Again, we're reminded that Paul has never met most of these believers. And, and that's important that we continue to think about that, because very often we are put in a situation where we disciple people at, a, at an arm's length. Uh, it may be people that we have a correspondence with, or we have a um, some kind of interaction with. Today, it would perhaps be over email or, or some other form, perhaps Zoom. Um, we haven't met face to face. We haven't met physically, and yet we can still have this great desire. Uh, Paul obviously has a very strong affection for these people, the people of um, the Lycus Valley. Um, and uh, as he thinks about it, uh, he thinks it almost as a father of a child, uh, the kind of same kind of affection. He's concerned for them. He has a care for them. He wants the very best for them, uh, just as a father would for his child. Uh, we know that Paul has traveled through this area several times and even spent two years in Ephesus, uh, very nearby, but uh, never made it quite out to, um, to this location. In chapter one, we were introduced to Epaphras, uh, the one who was called the faithful uh, brother, uh, who was most likely saved under Paul. Again, we don't know that for certain. It may have been under Peter or, or, or even one of the other disciples of Paul, but he certainly had a great appreciation and love for Paul as well, as well as for the people that lived uh, in that area. And so as Paul thinks about them, he thinks about, um, uh, again, the churches in the surrounding areas where there was a large Jewish population. Um, in, in Hierapolis especially, we know that there was at least a community of perhaps over 50,000 uh, Jewish people living there. Uh, and it's likely that some of them might have come from Jerusalem later, um, as Paul did, and began to share the gospel uh, even as uh, evangelists themselves as they came uh, to this area. And so Paul, as we think about this, first of all, Paul's in prison. He's never met the people, or we believe he's never met most of them. But he, he wants them to know four things. And that's very clear in those first re verses that we read together. I want you to know, he starts off his chapter. Uh, I want you to know uh, what a great conflict or what a great struggle he has for them. And so as we think about that, we think about the four things that Peter wants, to, uh, Paul rather, wants them to know. First of all, he wants them to be educated. He says, I don't want you to be ignorant of these things. Uh, some translations use that phrase, not have you ignorant. Uh, this is perhaps a more powerful way of expressing that term that I want you to know. <clears throat> but it was a desire for that the believers should a clear and certain, that the, these believers should have a clear and certain knowledge um, of the word of God and the truths that have been laid out for them. So he wanted them to be educated. Secondly, he wanted them to be aware Paul uses the strong statement that he wants them to know. Uh, sometimes believers are, are uh, criticized for being uh, anti-intellectuals. Uh, Paul was certainly an intellectual. He was a man who valued study and, and education and learning. But he also wanted them to be aware of the things that were going on around them. Uh, again, there's a, there's a, a, a mild rebuke, or perhaps even a, a, a overt rebuke here for those who would call themselves Gnostics, people who had special knowledge. They believed that they knew what others did not know. Well, Paul says, I want everybody to know. I want you to know and to be aware uh, of the things that I'm teaching you. Um, and thirdly, he wanted them to be discerning. Um, you know, as we think about this, the word, uh, the book of Colossians uses the word know and knowledge 10 times in this uh, one book, in this letter. Um, and so he did not want them to be confused or misled by the various religious influences that were going on around them. 
He wanted them to have a knowledge of the will of God. Uh, he wanted them to <clears throat> have a knowledge of God himself, a knowledge of the mystery of God, which we spent some time talking about in our last uh, lesson. And he wanted them to be filled with all wisdom and knowledge. So Paul wasn't pushing back on knowledge. Uh, he wanted that knowledge, uh, but he wanted them to be discerning in the type of knowledge that they, uh, that they took on. There must be knowledge that was tested and proven. Um, and then lastly, he wanted them to be united. You know, at the beginning, he used the word conflict. Uh, not every um, translation uses that word. They might use struggle. I have a great conflict for you or struggle for you. Um, but the word that is used there uh, in verse one is actually the word agon, uh, from which we get our English word agony. And um, it originally meant a, pace, a place of assembly. Uh, for athletic contests. So this would be like the uh, the Colosseum uh, or any kind of stadium. Uh, the word came from that. Uh, originally, that's where the, the meaning was found. Uh, but eventually it came to mean the enormous emotional and physical strain felt by someone who was under stress. He had this great emotional and physical strain for the people of Colossae. Uh, it is a continuation of his of where we ended up last time when he said that he was laboring for them, striving. It's the same word again. The same thought behind that is that he's pushing, uh, pushing to the end. And, you know, the, the same word <clears throat> that is used, it's used six times in the New Testament. And all of them are used in regard to striving under difficult circumstances. We find it when he talks about to fight the good fight. Uh, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. All of those it were implied this great physical and emotional struggle that he had for them. And so he wanted them to know that he was united with them. His heart was united with them and it was united uh, through suffering. And so that's what we know about Paul, these four things that we know about Paul. <clears throat> but as we go further into the, the uh, passage uh, under consideration tonight, we come to number two where we read there concerning the comfort for them in full assurance of understanding, full assurance of understanding. So for, Paul has just told us four things about himself, but now we read four things that Paul wants for the believers. And this is where we come to that heading that we have, the wish. If Paul had a wish, this is what his wish would be, these four things. <clears throat> this is Paul's second prayer for the believers. We had a, a first prayer in, in uh, in um, Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, he prayed for the believers there. And again, he prayed for wisdom and knowledge for them there also. But again, now he prays for these believers. And what he prays for is, first of all, that their hearts would be encouraged. Their hearts would be encouraged. Uh, in the King James Version, this word is translated comforted. Uh, and that's a correct translation. That's a good translation for that. Uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 3, we are reminded that the God that God is the God of all comfort. And he is the one who comforts us, and he does that by strengthening us and by encouraging us. It's the same word that's used there. And so the common understanding is that in both cases, individuals were facing very difficult trials where comfort and strengthening were needed, and the comfort gave them the courage that they needed. So he wanted them, first of all, that their hearts would be encouraged. Secondly, that their hearts would be knit together in love. Uh, the sense here is the unity of the body of Christ. And we've talked about what an important concept that is in the book of Colossians, that they have unity in the body of Christ, which is the church. Um, and so <clears throat> the place where that unity is shown or demonstrated is through love. And so again, he wants them united but united in love, not just that they're united under a banner, a name, uh, or that they meet at a certain time and a place, uh, but that love is the motivator uh, for their unity. It means that they speak with one mind and with one purpose, and that purpose is in Christ Jesus. And again, we're reminded uh, of some of the passages in, in Acts, especially at the beginning of Acts, where we read over and over again that the disciples were of one accord, uh, that they were in one place and they were of one accord, which meant that they were all united in spirit and in purpose together. Um, <clears throat> A.W. Tozer, the author in his book, uh, The Pursuit of God, asks this question. 
which is a good question to ask, um, just to give us an understanding of it. He says, has it ever occurred to you that 100 pianos all tuned to the same fork are automatically tuned to each other? They are of one accord by being tuned together, not to each other, but to another standard to which each one must individually bow. So 100 worshipers meeting together, each one looking to Christ, are in heart nearer to each other than they could possibly be were they to become unity conscious and turn their eyes away from God to strive for closer fellowship. And so when we talk about unity, the goal is not for us to, to force the issue that we all be united, but that we all focus our eyes on Christ, that we all be united to him and in him, and that will bring the unity of the body uh, that we need. The third thing Paul uh, wants and desires and wishes for the people in, um, in Colossae and, and beyond is that they would be growing spiritually. And here again, Paul returns to a common theme. He says, our spiritual maturity is dependent on our understanding and knowledge of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. This knowledge provides us with, full, with the riches of full assur assurance. And so let's just read that verse again as he talks about there uh, in verse 2, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding. Uh, and that's what Paul desires for them. And, you know, we get this sense, the uh, this threefold sense of the full assurance that Paul desires for them. Um, these three things, first of all, full assurance of faith. Uh, we want to have full assurance of faith. In Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 22, uh, we find that written. Let's just turn over to that very quickly. Hebrews chapter two, uh, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 22, we'll read that verse together. Hebrews 2, uh, 10 rather, and verse, um, and verse 22, sorry, I was in the wrong chapter there. It says, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And so this is something that we can have, but again, as we read in that passage, that we can only have it through Christ. Uh, this is perhaps the most uh, hopeful and the most encouraging uh, assurance for believers. If we don't have full assurance of faith, it doesn't matter about the other issues. Uh, that's the foundation uh, that we have because it is in Christ. It means that we have complete confidence in the redeeming an eternal work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this confidence or assurance also invites us into the presence of God himself. We can come, it says there, uh, with boldness, we find in Hebrews chapter 10, with boldness to enter into his presence become, because we come in the name of Christ. Um, not, we have not earned the right to be there. We haven't uh, earned the privilege of being there, but we come through the one who is worthy, uh, who has gone before us, and has made the way open uh, through his shed blood. It's a very important one for us there. Paul wants that, that they have full assurance, firstly, full assurance of faith. In this passage, we read that they want full assurance of understanding. And, you know, in our last study, we were reminded about the mystery. The mystery of God was that the Lord Jesus Christ was the head of the church, which included all of those who believed on him, both Jew and Gentile. That was the mystery, something... Um, prophesied in the Old Testament, but revealed in the New. And the further assurance that we receive is that Christ is in us. Uh, we read that in uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 17. That's the one that gives us this full assurance um, of understanding. Um, <clears throat> and then thirdly, we read that we should have full assurance of hope. And again, in the book of Hebrews, let's go to Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 11. And we read there, uh, the full assurance of hope that we have. Um, Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 11, it says, we're here again writing to, the, to the, the people in Hebrews, the Hebrews, we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end. And so this is something that he says that they have to desire, they have to want, they have to pursue, they have to be diligent about it. 
And again, it's found in Christ and Christ alone. Um, last week, again, as we were reminded in that chapter, in Colossians chapter, chapter 1, that, that we have Christ in us, the hope of glory, the hope of glory found in us. In Romans chapter 15, and I'll just read this one, we don't need to turn to it. We read there the motivation that we have. Romans 15, verse 13, May the God of hope fill you all with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope, and of course, this is not a man-made hope, but one hope that is assured and empowered by the Holy Spirit through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's the number three in the things that uh, Paul wishes and desires for them. Number four, he wants them to have uh, hearts filled with hidden treasure. And again, we find that that hidden treasure is the treasure of Christ. Let's just read that verse together again as we've read there before, uh, when it talks about Christ in verse two, and then goes on, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And so Paul desires for them to be possessors of hidden treasure, uh, and uh, sorry, the possessors of knowledge and wisdom. Uh, and of course, this is very essential for spiritual maturity. Um, we can receive Christ with a simple knowledge of the gospel, we don't need to understand much more than the fact that uh, we are sinners, that he is sinless, that he is our savior, the one that went to the cross for us. And we can accept that uh, in, in simple faith that we can have faith in him. We can put our faith in him. But if we are to grow in Christ and to mature, we need to have a deeper and a fuller understanding uh, of the truth uh, and the truth that we find in Christ, not in the things of the world. And so it's no coincidence that the words wisdom and knowledge are found together over 31 times in Scripture. Knowledge is something that can be studied and learned. Uh, Paul, again, a very well-educated man, understood the importance of knowledge. In Romans 13, verse 11, he proclaims, Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. And in Vincent Word studies, we find uh, an explanation of this. He explains that this verse is not talking just about the depths of the riches, but it should really be read describing the depths of the riches, the depths of the wisdom, and the depth of the knowledge. In this passage also, Paul says that they are unsearchable. And unsearchable doesn't mean that they are unknowable. It just means that they are inexhaustible, that we will continue to search, we will continue to, to discover, uh, we will continue to find that treasure, that treasure that's hidden in Christ, the longer that we study. And then secondly, the knowledge and, and now wisdom. Uh, full wisdom is an attribute of God. God is the only one, the, the Godhead, the Trinity, is the only one who have this attrib attribute of full wisdom. Um, but we can enter into the wisdom of God in some small ways. God desires that, that we take his wisdom. Uh, we can't have it in the same way that he has it. We'll never be all-knowing, uh, omniscient, uh, but we can have some knowledge as he reveals it to us. But wisdom for us is the God-given ability to apply those things that we've learned from the word of God. Um, God's wisdom, that is the wisdom that's from above, is contrasted uh, with the wisdom that is earthly, that is governed by the senses, that is demonic. Uh, we find that description in James uh, chapter 3, and verse 15, 16, and 17. This passage gives us a perfect description of the effects that godly wisdom should have on our character and on our conduct. In verse 17 of James 3, we read, But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and of good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And of course, we just have to measure our own lives against that again and say, do I have that kind of wisdom? Have I entered into that kind of wisdom with him? Um, lastly, verse three of this passage that we're looking at um, tonight, uh, actually we're gonna get getting into the next section, 
Um, in the last verse of the section, we read of the source of both his knowledge and wisdom, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He is the source of our wisdom. Um, we find that word all. Again, that's a word that we, is repeated over and over. As I look over here at my Bible, we find that in verse um, uh, in verse uh, 3. In whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And we have that, that uh, all repeated over and over again, especially here in the book of, um, uh, the book of Colossians. Uh, here we read, in him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Uh, in just the first two chapters of Colossians, we read that in Christ we might find all might, in verse 11 of chapter 1. We find all things created, uh, chapter 1, verse 16. All things consist, uh, chapter 1, verse 17. Preeminent in all things, in chapter 1, verse 18. And in him all the fullness dwells, in chapter 1, verse 19. And then as we thought about in our study just recently, that all things are reconciled, all things are reconciled uh, with God through him. And this all culminates here in verse, uh, in verse 3 of chapter 2, that in him all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are found. And so as we grow in our knowledge of Christ, we are promised to be filled with wisdom. Um, Paul prays for the believers in Ephesus for wisdom. He prays this in Ephesians chapter 1, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his, of his inheritance in the saints. And so we see this wonderful picture here of the, what the Lord Jesus Christ uh, brings to us. I'm sorry, I pulled up the slide a little bit too early there. But as we think about this, we want to uh, think about here the way, the second uh, part of our section that we're going to consider tonight. And we're, we're going to go through it fairly quickly because um, there's a lot of ground to cover. Um, but Paul begins in verse 4 by saying, This I say, lest anyone should deceive you with pervasive or persuasive words, uh, which maybe are pervasive as well. But uh, there's a danger of beguiling talk that entices people away from God. And so I wanted to consider just for a couple of moments the types of false teachers that we find there. And again, I'm just going to give you the passages and, and I can send these to you as well because we, we, our time is, is limited. Um, but we find the types of false teachers. In 2 Peter 2, 1, we find the deniers. It says, there were also false prophets among the people even as there will be false prophets among you who will secretly bring in destruct destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. And so we have these deniers or deceivers. We also have those that are frauds in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 3. It says, if anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words, from which come envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. For such withdraw yourself, from such withdraw yourself. And so there, there are those who come in to stir up, to create confusion, to bring doubt, but they do it for their own personal gain, to enrich themselves. And honestly, we just have to look around the, the landscape of the church in North America uh, to see many who have, who have fleeced the flock, uh, who have stolen uh, literally life savings from people over their lives from such withdraw yourself. Uh, in, Jude, in Jude verse 4, we read of the predators. It says, Therefore certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men, who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. And so they've used the gospel as a way to prey on others, sexually and morally, and so we would call them predators uh, because they're using the gospel for this, um, for this purpose. 
Uh, in 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, we find the false prophets. Uh, John writing says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And so we need to be aware that there are false prophets. They are teaching false things, and we need to test them against the word of God. We find again in the book of Jude, uh, in verse 18, the dividers, those that divide people one against another. There we read, but you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. These are sensual persons who cause divisions, not having the spirit. And so we need to be aware and discerning and vigilant against those who are dividers as well. We then find those, and this is the last of the two, we find those that are the pleasers. They seek to please others, again, maybe for some of the other reasons we've mentioned above. But in 2 Timothy chapter 4, 3 and 4, we read this. You're familiar with these verses, I know. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires. Because they have itching ears, they will heap up to themselves uh, teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. People want to hear the things that make them feel good. People want to hear the things that tickle their ears. It says here they've got itching ears. They want to be entertained. They want to be amused. And, um, and there are plenty of people out there who are false teachers who will do just that. And then lastly, we have what they might call the innovators. Uh, Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 9, it says here, Do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines. For it is good that the heart be established by grace, not with foods which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. And then we find also in 1 Timothy chapter 6, it says, O Timothy, Guard what was committed to your trust, avoiding the profane and idle babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. By professing, uh, and by professing it, some have strayed concerning the faith. faith. Uh, and so these are people who are introducing new things. Whenever we have new things introduced, things that we've never heard before, things that we've never considered before, uh, it's very important that we go back and test that against Scripture and against others, uh, with others who are godly and knowledgeable believers uh, in the truth, uh, because people are constantly inventing new ways, and it says here, various and strange doctrines. We need to be aware of them. I read I, I, somewhere, and I don't know who was the person that said this. I've seen it quoted in a number of different places. But when we think of false teachers, uh, it's very easy for us to be taken in by them. Uh, in this quote, it says that it's been said that the devil doesn't come to you with a red cape and pointy horns, but he comes as everything you have ever wanted. And so we need wisdom and discernment to follow after God's word and not to be swayed by the false teachers uh, of this age. Let's think now as we continue, as Paul goes on and he talks about the way, this is the way I want you to live, um, to combat the rise of false teachers in the local church, Paul lays out seven things that should be present in a Christ-following, Bible-believing, Spirit-led local church. Uh, these are not easy, but they are attainable, especially with good leadership and good teachers. And so as we think of the seven marks of a healthy local church, we consider from the passage that we have here tonight, um, as we picked it up there, first of all, in verse five, he says uh, of good order. And when we think of good order, we are often reminded uh, of the uniform array of a troop of soldiers uh, who, are, who are set for inspection. Um, there has to be order for consistency and for accountability. And Paul has used the, the analogy, um, the example of a soldier before, uh, one who is engaged in warfant, uh, warfare, uh, not a weekend reservist. In 2 Timothy, and again, we won't go to it, but, Tim, but Timothy, uh, Paul tells Timothy that a good soldier should be one who could endure hardship, one who is a good soldier of Jesus Christ. That's, in other words, one who is obedient to the one who leads, one who's engaged in warfare not sitting on the sidelines, 
one who is not entangled by the things of the world. And then lastly, he must seek to please the one who is leading, the one who enlisted uh, him. And so <clears throat> I, I have many examples. I was a young man of, of 17 when I went into the military and, and I, did, I went to boot camp. And uh, the first day when we were out on the parade square was quite horrible, actually. We were given instructions and we were all bumping into each other and we weren't working as a team and, and it was just terrible. And of course, there was a lot of yelling and a lot of swearing that day uh, by those that were uh, trying to get us into order and bring us into good order. Um, but it, it eventually, as we practiced it over and over and over and over again, we began to act in unison. Our boots were striking it in unison. Our, our, our turns were in unison. Everything was in unison. But it required two main things. It required self-discipline and it required listening to only one voice. We no longer listened to the people that were around us. We listened to that one who was in charge of us. At that point, it was the sergeant major. Uh, but today, in, the, in terms of the local church, it would be to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we need to be self-disciplined. We need to have good order. And so he commended them for that. We also need to be steadfast in the faith. This is an important one as well. Uh, Paul's second mark or, or distinguishing mark of a, of a, uh, a healthy local church uh, is steadfast in the, in the faith. And steadfastness requires two unshakable things. An army set about in an unbreakable square to defend itself against the attacks of the enemy. Uh, this is a defense strategy that has been used by armies for centuries. Um, I read that in uh, essaymilitaryhistory.org. It said a square could not be moved into enemy, uh, sorry, a square could be moved into enemy held territory if the ground was suitable, as it was a defensible formation, uh, even though it invited attack. Uh, an attack being imminent, the square could be halted and all would turn outward to resist the enemy. And so there's this unbreakable square that we should have. The second thing we required is to have an unshakable firmness, which only came through strength and training and discipline and courage. These are all great attributes that should be developed firstly in our own lives, but also be seen in our local church. A healthy church cannot be uh, made up of unhealthy believers. Uh, and so it starts first with the believers. We need to be healthy believers and healthy believers and healthy families will make and I'm talking about spiritually, will make healthy local churches. And so we need to have good order. We need to be steadfast in the faith. It says that also our third one is that we should be walking in him. And, you know, walking is one of those interesting things. Uh, we typically don't have to tell people um, that we're walking forward. I, if I said I saw somebody walking yesterday, we would assume they were walking forward. And so it's a directional thing. Uh, we would only re make a comment about it if the person was walking backwards, uh, because that would be against the norm. And so it seems obvious, but many of us do go backwards in our walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not always a straight path for us. Sometimes we're standing still, sometimes we're moving backwards. Uh, but he, Paul is, is saying we need to be walking in him. It needs to be forward progress in our spiritual life especially in the face of hardship, of trial, and of course the distractions from the world that is all around us. Um, also walking with him, um, we can get not only the direction, but also the desire. Uh, walking demonstrates our desire to follow after him. Our verse that we read tonight says, as you have received Christ, so walk in him. Our walk should demonstrate our affection and our obedience to our Savior. And so we want to walk in, in him. But it also, not just our direction and our desire, but also our determination. In Acts chapter 20, verse 24, Paul lays out his own mission and demonstrates his determination when he writes, this is in the uh, ERV version, he writes, I don't care about my own life. The most important thing is that I finish my work. I want to finish the work that the Lord Jesus gave me to do, to tell people the good news about God's grace. And so there's a determination in our walk. The fourth thing we're told there is that we need to be rooted, rooted. 
you know, Paul does like to use examples and illustrations from everyday life. And this example comes from agriculture to be rooted. Farmers again know the importance of deep roots uh, in, and, and those deep roots in good soil, not in bad soil. Um, and in the passage referencing the soldier above, Paul also refers to the believer, uh, uh, compares him to the farmer in, in 2 Timothy 2, 6. The farmer is referred to as hardworking. Uh, and those that have worked on a farm, which I have not, um, but I've seen people who worked on farms, the thing that we know and understand about them is that they rise early and they work late. They know how to work and they know how to wait. Sometimes there are times of planting, sometimes there are times of waiting. Uh, they know the seasons, they know the weather. In other words, they're familiar with the surroundings in their, in their area. Uh, they know their land, they know their seed, they know the things that they're planting. And they expect a harvest and they participate in that harvest. These are all things that, that a farmer would understand. And as believers, we should be rooted in the good soil of Christ so that we might be found faithful rising early, working late, um, knowing how to work, knowing how to wait, uh, wait on God, uh, knowing the circumstances around us that are surrounding us and being uh, fully assured of, our, of the things that we're working on, uh, the land and the seed, which again talk of, of the word of God and the truth of it. Uh, fifthly, we read that we're to be not just rooted, but built up. That's a very different, being rooted is an agricultural term, being built up is an architectural term or a construction term, if you like. Um, the other thing we notice about that word is uh, in, in the previous word, the word rooted was in the past tense. And so we were planted and we need to stay there. That's our salvation in Christ. We've been, removed, we've been rooted and we must remain rooted. But built up is in a present continuing tense. And so it's the process of, of continuing to build on and to build on and to build on, especially on the foundation. Um, and we're reminded in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 about our sure foundation, that foundation that is in Christ Jesus. And we're to be careful to build on that foundation and that foundation alone. And then we find here again, we, we come back to this word again, to be established. What does it mean to be established? Um, several translations suggest that this word would better be translated as confirmed in the faith or assured in the faith or made confident in the faith. The longer we walk in truth and in Christ um, and in the Christian life, the more we can be assured or confirmed in our faith. It becomes easier. When we're first saved, we have many, many doubts. When we face trial, sometimes we have doubts. But the longer we walk in our Christian life, uh, the more that we should be assured of those things. But the Apostle Paul, uh, sorry, the Apostle Peter suggests that much of our maturing comes through suffering, something that we try desperately to avoid. We don't want to suffer. Uh, we try not to suffer. But Paul tells us, rather, the Apostle Peter tells us that there are four things that come out of suffering. And, and I won't read the verse, but if you can go to 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10, we'll find, first of all, that we're to be perfected. And this doesn't mean that we'll be made perfect or sinless or that we have uh, uh, unable to sin. The thought is of us being completed or, or perfectly restored, restored to the place where God wants us to be. Peter knew about the joy of this from his personal experience. When he denied the Lord Jesus Christ, he ran out into the night and wept. Uh, his life was, was uh, changed from that point on. He had denied the one he professed to love. And the Lord graciously restored him. Feed my sheep, feed my lambs. And um, God commissioned him through the Lord Jesus Christ for this work. And so we find uh, two uses of this word that will help us better understand it. Um, not perfect in the way that we think without blemish or spot. But the first would be used in the setting of a broken bone, uh, like a broken arm. Um, it will be mended. It'll never be quite 100% um, again, but it will be mended for the most part. The second use would be for the mending of nets that had been broken. The same word would be used there. In both cases, there are probably marks of that restoration, marks of that 
um, that restoring and that completing and that perfecting process, even though we have been made whole again and the nets have been made whole again as well. So the first thing is that we're perfected. The second, that we are grounded securely, grounded securely. Again, the thought is somewhat similar to being rooted and built up and established. But the thought here is not just that we accept the truths of our faith, but that our faith has been made as solid as granite, unshakable, unmovable. It's something that's very important that we have that. We see the word used of the suffering of believers in Thessalonica when Paul writes to them that he has sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith. And then number six, that we're to be, um, um, oh, sorry, this is, we're still in number six, uh, number, num, number four of, of, of part six, uh, to we're to be settled. Uh, this is part of us being established, that we'd be settled. Uh, here the thought is removing everything else but the foundation and then building off that strong bedrock uh, in order to give us assurance of those things that we believe. Uh, and again, we Paul writes to the believers in Ephesus saying that their faith, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the spirit. And so that's what it means to be established, all of those things, to be perfected and to be securely grounded and to be uh, strengthened and to, um, to, to, to be on that bedrock of, of faith. But lastly, we read the mark of a healthy local church is that we are a thankful people, that we are thankful. Um, we of all people should be the most thankful of any on this uh, on this earth. We have received so much, uh, blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, and many of those blessings we have even right now. Uh, there was a Bible speaker who was once uh, at a conference, and um, one of the songs that they hymns that they sang there was uh, the hymn "A Thousand, A Thousand Thanksgivings." And yet, as he looked around and as he spoke to people, he found that very often. They were not thankful. They were just not thankful people. And so he challenged a friend to write and then share 1,000 things that he had to be thankful for and to share them within one month. That's quite a task. 1,000 things that you would be thankful for in a space of a month. That would be about 250 thankful things a week, which is about 33 uh, thankful things a day. So you're going to have to really think about that uh, if that's something uh, we we want to do. Uh, what a joy it would be to find new ways to thank the Lord if we could thank him every day and in a month come up with a thousand reasons to be thankful. Um, as we come to, to the end of our, our passage here, I just want to touch on these last few verses together. Um, Paul returns to the theme that he started in verse 2, where he warned them not to be deceived um, with per persuasive words. And he warns them here that they're to be a deceivers that they're to be aware of and to avoid. And he says here, he uses a, a word, I would say strong warning. He uses the word beware. Um, and this would be a similar to the urgent call that one might make uh, if someone were facing danger. We might yell out, look out uh, with urgency. That's what he's saying. Beware. Um, this is something that's important and urgent. Um, there are so many stories of sailors uh, that have ignored the storm warnings or train drivers that ignored the flags waving on the tracks or drivers who ignored the bridge out sign ahead. Uh, we can probably even add to the, some of those things ourselves. But there's a, a strong warning for us to be careful of deceivers, of false teachers. Um, he goes on to say that there are strong delusions. We read that in verse 8, beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy. And so that word to, to cheat is a pretty strong word, um, but really it has a much stronger word behind it. It's not just uh, deceiving or cheating, which some people feel like is a very acceptable sin. It has the meaning of carrying someone away into slavery by force or to plunder and loot, leaving people impoverished and defenseless. It's a very, very strong word that he uses there. 
uh, this word cheat. Um, most people think about cheating at, uh, at a board game uh, and that it's not a very serious thing. But when we use the word there, uh, would you pull somebody into slavery? Um, it is a very, very strong word. He also talks about the strong tools that are used. And uh, we read a number of them here. Uh, philosophy, empty deceit, the traditions of men, and the basic principles of the world. And so I just want to finish up with these last few things, and I apologize for going long today. Philosophy, we find this word here used here in Colossians chapter 2 uh, and, and verse 8, is the only time this word used in the same way uh, is found in the New Testament. The word originally meant a love of wisdom, come from the two words, the Greek words philo, love, and sophia, wisdom. But it had become corrupted. Uh, the way the word is written, it wasn't just philosophy, but it's written to imply that it is the philosophy of the false teacher, his philosophy. Uh, do not let them cheat you with his philosophy, not just philosophy in general terms. Um, just as by way of illustration, I, I give you a, a, an example. Many years ago, I, I met a young man. He was a seminary student. Um, we worked together for a while. He was a, a part-time worker with us while he was at seminary. But he was invited to go to a conference of Bible uh, translators. And he was very excited. He was looking forward to this time that he would be away uh, with these brilliant minds, these, these scholarly men. And um, as he began to meet with them, as he, as he spent time with them, he became increasingly discouraged because they began to become so uh, obsessed over the smallest detail of language that the language consumed them rather than the content of what they were reading. Um, it was all about tenses and 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 um, uh, commas and periods and should it go there or should it not go there. They had lost sight of of what they were reading and not uh, and more and become more concerned with the minutia, the smallest part of, of what they were doing. And so it had become their philosophy, uh, which was language, not the philosophy or the or the pursuit of truth uh, of the Word of God. And so as we read this, we're reminded of who Paul was addressing. There was probably already false teachers among them because Epaphras had taken that message back. Um, there were people that were teaching uh, who believed that they had special knowledge that only they possessed. And Paul was challenging the Judaizers who were trying to reintroduce the law and uh, the law of Moses for salvation. And then just these last couple of things here. It says empty deceits. Uh, Paul calls the method used vain or meaningless deceit. And so they used a variety of deceitful tactics to lure people into the teaching. In Matthew 13, we find the Lord speaking. It says, Now he who received seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of the world, or the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. This is what Paul is talking about. Don't be deceived by the things of the world, the flashy things of the world that have no value. They're empty. They're meaningless. And it's deceitful. And it will lead you away from the truth, not towards the truth. Paul also warned them against the traditions of men. Um, and, you know, we have to be very careful about this because tradition can be both good or bad. There are some good traditions, but we have to measure them against Christ. Uh, any tradition that's being proposed were without value if it was not based on Christ and upon the truth of the Word of God. And so we need to examine all traditions, and we have many of them. We need to examine them in the light of God's Word. And then lastly, the basic principles of the world. Uh, here Paul is talking to things that the world think are important that maybe we don't think are quite so important. And there are many things that are common to everyone everywhere. Science might be one of them. Science has almost become a god for some. Uh, not that we're anti-science or that we don't believe science, um, but some people make science their god. They make art or music or culture. Uh, any of these things which, um, which might have their place but take the place of Christ uh, will not bring everlasting life. We will not find Christ through science. We will not find Christ through art or through uh, through uh, music or, or any other thing, uh, we can only find Christ 
uh, as he's revealed to us in the word of God. And so while these things might have importance, then they do have value. Uh, we need to evaluate them uh, based on the word of God. People can be consumed by these things and then miss the most important truth, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, as we finish up today, I just want to leave one last thing with you, um, and hopefully this is something we can uh, pray about uh, for ourselves individually. If you profess to be a child of God, leave it to the Lord Jesus Christ to sanctify you in his own way. Uh, and this, of course, refers to the sometimes very painful ways that the Lord cha changes us, molds us, shapes us, uh, sometimes through the fire, sometimes through suffering. But the desire always is that he would make us into the people that he wants us to be. Let's pray. Uh, Father, we do thank you for this time together. We thank you for these many wonderful thoughts that we found in this passage and just commit them to you. We pray that you would apply them to our hearts and minds, that we might walk more faithfully after you and that we might follow after the Lord Jesus Christ, desiring daily to be more like him. And so we commit each one here now into your hands in the precious name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.